something and there's a blessing that's attached to it. And God gives us that honor within our own lives, the crown of life. And, and it's not that anybody has to know about anything in your life of what God has done, but it's something within your own life. You know how Mary, we're told that when the angel visited her and he told her that she was going to bear the Son of God, it says that she pondered these things in her heart. This was a treasure to her. She kept it within her heart. And so no one needs to know about anything, but God knows and you know, and that crown of life, that blessing within your heart of what God has done in you and what God is doing through you. And now to the subject then of temptation in verse 13 through 16 very quickly. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it brings... It gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. So twice in these verses, he says, one, don't, you know, let no man say, when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. And then he tells everybody, don't be deceived about this, my beloved brethren. Here's the truth. When you're tempted to do evil... It isn't God who's tempting you. So clearly there were people who were saying when they were being tempted to do evil, and tempted means the solicitation to evil. You're being solicited. We get solicitors who call us on the phone all the time, telemarketers. They're soliciting you. Uh, when you go sometimes to uh, you know, some commercial venture, there are people... They're saying, hey, come, come to my store. You see people holding signs, you know, come over here, get this. They're, they're soliciting you. They want you to come and to participate in something. And so there were people who were saying, it's God is soliciting me to evil. He says, let no man say that. Don't ever blame God. Don't pin the tail on the wrong person here. It isn't God who would ever solicit you to evil. Why is that? Well, he tells us. First of all, God cannot be tempted by evil. So there's no, within himself, he can't even be solicited to do evil. Even solicited. And he doesn't solicit anyone to do evil. God would never tempt you to do anything destructive. And so often, when a person is in a time of great trial, they may be thinking, well, maybe I should just forget about this, and maybe I should go here, maybe I should do this. Maybe that's what God wants for me to do. God would never call you away from Jesus Christ. Never. Never, ever. So God doesn't, he can't be tempted and he doesn't tempt anybody. And then in verse 14 and 15, he explains, this is how temptation really works. First of all, each one, so this is the same for you, same for me, same for James, to the 12 tribes, any Christian. Each one is tempted when, number one, he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So there is then the drawing away within and the enticement. It isn't God soliciting you to do evil. It is within yourself, in your fallen nature, in what the Bible calls your flesh, that you're being drawn away and you're being enticed. It's terminology that's used for a hunter or a fisherman. You know, when a hunter goes out and hides away and maybe he's trying to lure his prey out and so they'll make noises, whether it's duck hunting or other types of mammals, whatever it is, bears, deer, whatever they're looking for, turkeys, 
there's something they'll do and that animal is all of a sudden going to be, they're drawn away. There's from within them. They, they hear something. They, they want something. They smell something. And from within them, they're drawn away and they're enticed. Now, and it would be applicable really even to fishing. When you think of a little clear pond, a little quiet pond that has fish in it, they're minding their own business. And along comes a fisherman and he takes a, a fishing pole and puts a, the bait, a worm on the end of the hook and then he plops it in the water and all of a sudden it goes down. And you've got a couple of fish minding their own business and all of a sudden they see that worm dangling over there. And within themselves they think, you know, I'd like that worm. They get drawn away, they get enticed. And they swim over to where that is. And then the older fish, the wiser fish, who's been around the block a little bit, he says to the younger fish, you go ahead first. No, oh, okay. All right. I'm still working on my first joke, trying to get somewhere with you. But isn't that what happens? You're just drawn away and enticed. And that's the, the, the language that's used here. And so we live in a world, we live in these bodies, and when the Bible says the flesh, it isn't speaking of your physical flesh. It's speaking of the spiritual law, the principle within you called sin. Paul spoke of it in the book of Romans chapter 7. He said, you know what? He said, the things that I want to do, the right things, I don't do them all the time. And the things that I don't want to do, that I shouldn't do, I do them sometimes. And so he said, I've, I've thought all of this through and I've figured it out. Then it's no longer I who am sinning, but it's sin that dwells in me. I don't want to do that, but I do it. I want to do something, but I don't. Well, I don't want to or I want to... What is it? It's sin that dwells in me. And then he said, Oh, wretched man that I am. This is a terrible condition to be in. Now, by the way, the non-Christian doesn't quite think that way except as it relates to the depth and the, you know, the, uh, the health of their conscience. But non-Christians are different. They don't have the Spirit of God within them. You do. You've been adopted. The Spirit of God lives inside of you. That's why when you become a Christian, sin seems all the more worse for you than it did before you were a Christian. You know, before you were a Christian, you could sin all day, all night, party for the whole weekend. You're just tired on Sunday night that you can't, that it's Monday tomorrow. You let a Christian try to do that, they're going to be terrible and convicted and troubled. It's very hard to sin with ease as a Christian. There's this conviction that just chases you around. It's really even from within you. And so this is that principle of sin within. One other very important fact here, as you'll notice... In verse 15, he says, Then when desire has conceived, or when you give in to that drawn away, you give in to the desire, it gives birth to sin. That's when sin occurs. Up until that moment, it's just temptation. And there's a huge difference between being tempted and sinning. And a lot of times people misunderstand the fact, you know, I'm just being tempted. I'm, I'm not sinning. I'm just being tempted. And sometimes people think, well, if I'm a Christian, why am I being tempted? Well, because you have sin within you. You have that principle there. But you haven't sinned. You're just being tempted. Sinning is when you give in to the desire. That's when sin occurs. And a lot of times Christians are very condemned. They think, well, why am I being tempted? I shouldn't be tempted and God must be so mad at me, upset with me. Hey, listen, he's not that way. You're being tempted. But when you give in to the temptation, what it does, it gives birth to sin. 
And sin, when it's full grown, it brings death. He's just saying it just, it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse. Don't be deceived about this, he says. My beloved brethren. I love the fact that he adds that on there. And then very quickly in closing in verse 17 and 18, he turns the focus really now to the purposes of God. Then he says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Don't be deceived about what God does. Don't accuse God of tempting you. The reality is that he gives good gifts. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. I love this, that the Bible portrays God as being above us. For all we know, he's, we know he's with us. We know he's omnipresent. He's in a different dimension. But the Bible always speaks of God being above and, and coming down from God. He's greater than we are. He blesses us. He's so benevolent. Gifts come down from above with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. He's identifying not only is God above us and that he gives good gifts, but he also doesn't change. There's no variation. He's not in a good mood on Monday and in a bad mood on Tuesday. He's not merciful on Wednesday and then hateful on Thursday. He's always loving, always just, always merciful, always truthful, always patient, always loving, always careful. He never, ever changes. There's no variation. He's not more merciful one day than he is another. And he doesn't change from being one thing to the other. He's consistent. He's unchangeable. And then he made, lists a major blessing in verse 9, 18. He says, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. James identifies being a Christian here by saying, we've been brought forth out of death, out of the kingdom of darkness. We've been brought out of that. How? By the will of God, by his own will He brought us forth. Christ is our Savior. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be the first fruits of his creatures. James was saying that the early Christians were the first ones. There were more to come. They were just the first ones that came. And the Bible speaks a lot about the first fruits in agriculture. The very first little bit that you see, the first bit that you harvest, It's an indication there's more coming. And so the early Christians, they were the first fruits. They were the first ones that through the word of God, God brought them forth. And here we are today. When were you saved? You've been saved in that year, that time, that month, that day, going back 2,000 years to James. And you know something? Not only did God bring you forth out of darkness through his word, but he continues to bring you forth into his will through the word. If we had the time, you could look it up in John 17. Jesus prayed. He said, Father, sanctify them, set them apart, bring them forth by your word. Your word is truth. This is why it is so important to be open to, locked in, receptive to, holding in high regard the word of God. It's the only thing that's going to make you what God wants you to be. It's the only thing. It's the living word of God. You can sit there and wish all day that you were this, you were that, you were different. You could sincerely want to be this, this, and that. But the process for transformation is through the living word of God going into the people of God. It's, that's how God has set it up. That's how God does it. That's how God changes us. And so he's far from through with you. He saved you, and he's continuing to save you. He's continuing to change you. And someday he's going to completely save you. He'll completely change you, including every, your body will be changed. He's a saving God. And he works in us through the word of God. I sincerely hope you're saved if you're here